my name is Skip Pierce. My official name is Sidney Pierce. Um, I am recently retired. Uh, I spent 30 years um, in the Department of Biology at the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, I retired from there and moved to the University of South Florida uh, in Tampa. Uh, I actually chaired both departments. Um, and I retired uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, although um, I'm still, I still have a much smaller but a research program uh, going. I uh, first came to the MBL, I don't actually know the exact year, but it was 67, 68-ish, something like that, uh, as a graduate student, uh, where I took the uh, ecology course, which at the time was run by Larry Slobodkin uh, from Stony Brook and his priestly group, uh, which I must say turned me off from ecology forever, and I went on to other things. Uh, but nevertheless, I kept coming back to, uh, uh, to the MBL. Um, I uh, was an instructor in the old invertebrate zoology course uh, here under uh, two directors, Bob Josephson, uh, who unfortunately recently died, um, and then Mike Greenberg. And, and that was the last iteration of the invertebrate zoology course. It died after, I hope we didn't kill it, but nevertheless it died after, uh, after the last time we did it. Um, I, uh, between the time I took the ecology course uh, and the time I was involved in the invertebrate course, I, got, I finished my degree. Um, and um, uh, for better or for worse, Bob Josephson, who was the director at that point, asked me if I would serve as an instructor. Uh, so I did, but I never, I never took it. I only participated in teaching the invert course. I think it's pretty much uh, characteristic of all the courses here. I mean, the, the students that come here in the summer are a uh, generally a highly motivated, pretty bright cross-section of biology students from across the country. And we had, I don't know what, 30-ish, maybe 35, maybe 25 students uh, in the course every summer. And uh, we had faculty really from around the world. I, there were probably 10 of us that, uh, that, taught, uh, that taught in the course. Uh, I had my own students uh, take the course simply because of the high quality of the course and sort of the immersive uh, experience of it. I mean, you when you come here to take those courses, you're working all the time when you're awake at it. Unlike similar experience or similar courses at colleges where you go to class a couple times a week. I mean, here you're in it from the time you get up to the time you go to bed for six weeks, and some students stayed on for another six after that. So, um, uh, and the students were very good. I mean, one of the pleasures of uh, uh, being a professor is when you can work with really good, highly motivated students, and that's that's who come here in the summer. Well, at the time, uh, actually, what I was doing was fairly unique uh, at the MBL, which is mostly set up for people who work on squid giant axons and people who work on embryology of sea urchins. Uh, I was doing comparative physiology at the time. I was very interested in the way in which uh, cells control the amount of water in them. And I was using marine invertebrates as model systems of that because um, you can find particular species of marine invertebrates that do it very well. And so we were, we were studying the um, cell biology and biochemistry uh, underlying that process, which really I was, uh, I, I spent 25 odd years working on, uh, not only here, but, but at, uh, at College Park. Uh, but then I switched to the molecular biology of symbiosis, uh, which was a complete change of field, which is sort of hard to do, but uh, one of the organisms that lives up here um, has a what's called a chloroplast symbiosis, and it's one of the only places in the world where you can get the animals. And so we started to work on 
on that, and that's led us off into um, uh, things like gene transfer between multicellular organisms. Actually, uh, interestingly enough, it was a couple of students in the invertebrate course back in the day. Uh, the students used to have to do projects uh, with particular faculty members. And um, so I'd get, I forgot how we divided them up, but I get five or six students that I had to do some independent research thing. And I would just tell them, go out and find some animals and we'll go from there. And uh, these two women students uh, came into my lab with a Petri dish with these two little green sea slugs in them. And I'd never seen those before. So when, what, what are those? Where the hell did you find those? And so, well, they found them in the mill pond over here behind the little um, Catholic church in the ball field there. No idea what they were. Uh, but uh, anyway, to make a long story short, it turned out that that's the species that really does the chloroplast symbiosis the best in the entire world. I mean, I, I work on species from all over the place, but but these guys from Woods Hole do it the best, and and so uh, I started to work on them. And actually, at the time, I wasn't interested in the chloroplast symbiosis at all. I was interested in the fact that those little sea slugs tend to be extremely salt tolerant, and and that's what we were working on initially in the early parts of my career. So we started to work on that, and you know, I would go places and give seminars about you know, uh, the salt tolerance. And everyone would say to me, well, that salt tolerance stuff's interesting, but those things are green. Why aren't you working on So about 20, 25 odd years ago, I switched over to the chloroplast uh, symbiosis. And it's turned out to be, um, I think, not only enormously uh, interesting, but it's turned out to be perhaps a very important, uh, uh, very important model system because of the fact that the sea slugs have genes that they've transferred from the algal nucleus into the animal nucleus. And that's, you know, that's gene therapy right there. So we'll see. I, I won't last long enough to figure all that out, but hopefully somebody else will. There's a whole, there's a whole number of species of slugs that do this thing. And they're all around uh, all around the world. In fact, uh, as I told you, I now live in Tampa, and most of the animals that, um, or most of the species that we work on now live in the Florida Keys or in the Caribbean. They eat particular species of algae. They're all herbivorous, and uh, certain cells that line the walls of their digestive tubules are able to grab the chloroplasts as they go through the digestive system and incorporate them into the cells. And they maintain the chloroplasts in there for varying lengths of time, depending on the species of slug. But if you shine light on the slug, uh, it'll fix carbon and it'll make oxygen. And you can show the appearance of carbon in metabolites in the slug. So photosynthesis is going on right there. Now, uh, photosynthesis, though, is a destructive process. The, the process of light harvesting blows away the chloroplast. So, for basically, it's the UV light. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so a number of species just keep eating the algae, and so they renew the chloroplast that way. But the one that lives up here can keep the chloroplast inside the cells for nine months without renewing anything, which is much longer than they would ever exist in the, in the algae. So the question uh, that was of interest, at least to me, was how the hell can they do that? I mean, uh, because chloroplast proteins and things like chlorophyll and so on have to be resynthesized and turned over constantly in the thing. And how do you do that? Well, you do it with genes, right? So, we and a few other labs began to look for those genes, and it's been a long, teeth-gnashing, unpleasant, politically complicated process. But uh, we finally found that in the slug that lives up here, at least, we found over 50 algal genes, all related to chloroplast maintenance and chlorophyll synthesis and so on, are now present in the slug DNA. 
So those genes somehow got transferred from the algal nucleus into the animal nucleus. And of course, the million dollar question is how does that occur? And I don't know. I have some ideas about how it occurred, but no data. And as I said, probably won't last long enough to get the answers to that. But clearly, that's that's of some importance. Uh, so the, there, and that was the first evidence. I mean, people have found it, gene transfers in other species, but this was the first evidence not only of gene transfer, but also of taking an organelle from a completely foreign cell and putting it into some other place and maintaining it and using it. I mean, it's truly a remarkable adaptation, I think. Uh, so that, in a nutshell, is sort of uh, um, uh, sort of what we've done the last 20 years with that thing. And really, it all started with uh, a couple of students in that invertebrate course. Really, the advantage to MBL is, of course, uh, aside from the, uh, 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 you know, the intellectual horsepower that shows up here in the summer, uh, is there was running seawater in the laboratories, which doesn't occur much anymore, sort of paradoxically. Um, and I could get the animals. And, and both of those weren't available in Washington, D.C., which is where I was working, and were really necessary for me to successfully do the experiments that we wanted to do. So I had to go to a marine lab somewhere uh, to get it done, and my inclination always was to come here simply because I, I knew the place, the people knew me, and so on and so forth. And in the summer, um, uh, very smart people come here to play tennis or go sailing or whatever the hell else they do beside stuff in the lab, and usually uh, conversations that you have with those folks about research are worth having. It's important, I think. I mean, it, you know, it, it's not only things like gene therapy, but it's also important to evolution. I mean, it, evolution, you know, is supposed to be spontaneous mutation and things, but, but if you can take a gene that's already been sort of vetted by evolution, and drop it into your nucleus and get it to function, it saves yourself a lot of time in an evolutionary sense. And so there's, uh, and, and clearly it happens all the time. Most of the time it doesn't work. But every time you eat a hamburger, you're getting a mouthful of cow DNA, you know, and if somehow that DNA can, and so on. So every time you get sick, you get a, slab of DNA from somebody else. So we get foreign DNA into us all the time. Most times it doesn't work, but when it does work, it, it can sort of be instant evolution like that. So uh, I think it's important from several points of view. The reason that I'm here right now, I'm never here in the summer. The reason that I'm here right now is because last weekend, uh, we had a class reunion. It was the 40th class reunion of the last time the invertebrate course was ever taught here. Uh, and unfortunately, those particular students weren't here. But we had 15 students of the 30 or so showed up to the reunion. And there's still three faculty members consuming oxygen. So <laughs> we'll see. I, we probably won't be around for the 50th, but nevertheless. <laughs> I still come back now, not so much to do research, but uh, to use the library, which is uh, really one of the finest biologically oriented library facilities in the world. Uh, so I come here to write. Uh, and also, um, I come here to collect uh, animals, which I then take back with me to Tampa uh, to work on. The MBL has really been an integral part of uh, my career, and uh, uh, you know, I, if it wasn't here, I, you know, who knows what what would have happened. But clearly, uh, the people that I met here and uh, the opportunity to interact with them, uh, as well as the physical location of it, have all contributed uh, a lot to what I do, and have done. I guess I don't do much of it anymore. But it, um, 
it, it's a very unique place. Intellectual stuff that's come out of here over the last hundred odd years has just been phenomenal. And uh, the number of people who come here and get together during the summer is, has also been uh, phenomenal, at least in a biological sense.